Like, Just bear with me, I'm just sorting the Facebook. Okay, so we're good. Um, so hello everyone and um, thank you. Thank you for joining. Um, it's thrilled, I was thrilled to see so many signed up again to, to tonight's um, Zoom, which is fantastic. Um, and as we know from the last conversation we had, um, we definitely uh, need more conversations, not just, I guess, around women's health in general, but de definitely around um, pelvic, uh, pelvic health. So I'm, I'm thrilled and thanks to all the panelists uh, who joined tonight. Um, so we have Yvonne Brady, um, director and um, engineer from EVB Sports, um, who is well known in Ireland for her um, fantastic products that uh, she has developed um, for helping um, establish your core and keeping your core strong. Uh, we've Maeve Whelan, uh, who to me is the oracle, the guru, the renowned uh, uh, physio when it comes to all things pelvic health. Um, I guess I met uh, Maeve, was, I think it was after my first child back in the day, Maeve. So um, we've been on a journey together. And yeah. Jane Lewis, uh, I guess, I think everyone knows you, Jane. <laughs> um, or I think most people who um, who follow me and join the the webinars and so forth are very familiar with Jane, um, who's the author of My Menopausal Vagina and um, um, also a guru on all things uh, vaginal atrophy and menopause and uh, many other uh, related issues. Um, so to to start us off tonight. Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about my experience in terms of uh, pelvic health and um, my, um, my journey with Maeve. And then um, Maeve is going to talk to us um, about the importance of pelvic health and our core and minding ourselves, particularly um, from our 40s. So I guess from my perspective, I have three boys. Um, after my first son, I didn't notice uh, too much in terms of um, incontinence or anything like that. Um, I probably found after my third child, um, he's now eight, I definitely started to experience um, some issues uh, around slight leakage and so forth. And that was when um, I started uh, to see Maeve. Um, and I may actually have seen you Maeve, I think between my second and third as well. Um, and I did um, some of the fabulous um, pelvic exercises, which were great. And the, I guess the, I did, there's probably a better term on it, Maeve, in terms of the internal work um, that you do. Um, but certainly, uh, I guess I know firsthand the positive benefits that you can get from seeing um, an experienced um, physio. And particularly, the, I guess the thing I learned the most was that sooner rather than later, um, I was probably 
in 42, I think, um, when I started to notice the slight incontinence and where I probably noticed it the most was when I was doing exercise. Um, so even if I was doing a walk or I was running, um, I'd notice it there or, you know, if you have the odd sneeze and so forth, that's kind of um, uh, when I started to notice I wasn't as maybe as taunt or um, I didn't have the same control that I had before um, having kids. And just one caveat that, I, that I'd add on to that, because a, a lot of some of the questions that came through today were from women who haven't had children and they are suffering from incontinence issues and they wondered why. Um, and I guess one of the things that, that I've gotten to know over the last few years is that um, whether you've had a child or not, you can still experience um, pelvic issues when it comes to menopause. And I think that's important to understand because a lot of um, women I've spoken to in the past would very much feel, oh, well, I haven't had kids, so I'm fine. Whereas in actual fact, you still need to be proactive um, when it comes to uh, looking after um, your pelvic core and health and so forth. Um, so Maeve, just in terms of, um, I guess we know the importance of it, but to many people watching here may not be familiar with the importance of managing your core and what to look out for um, in terms of uh, the pelvic health. So could you maybe talk us through some of the, the, the key things that we should be aware of? Uh, I will. Thank you very much. And you probably need to rein me in because I could talk <laughs> on this and I could talk forever and a day. So. Um, but I'll try and be as clear and concise um, as I can and as, as useful um, to, I know there would be certainly a, a very wide range of uh, listeners there. So um, just on the, because I forget to say this, on the last point that you just mentioned there, the, the fact that so many people would have symptoms and haven't had childbirth and it's not related to childbirth and get to menopause and, um, and haven't experienced childbirth and haven't any of the damage of it. There's, there's, a, there's a particular study that showed that said that up to 60% of women, nearly 57 point something of women, when they reported, when they were on their first babies in hospital and they were, were reporting and, and filling out questionnaires in terms of whether they ever had any symptoms in terms of bladder or bowel or pain or prolapse, and, uh, and nearly about 57 point something reported that they had some symptoms in at least one of those areas. So bladder, bowel, pain or prolapse and at, at least uh, one symptom. So this really tells us that this is, there's, a, there's an underlying pelvic floor type, there's a, certainly a prevalence there and pelvic floor dysfunction or pelvic floor problems is absolutely not um, related just to childbirth. Mm. Roll back from that then and, um, and talk about just the pelvic floor first and what it is. And best way that I can do that rather than um, talking to the screen, just show the pelvic model that I happen to have on standby. I wonder, um, Catherine, can you see that if I'm showing that to... Yeah, to just I'd say lift it a tiny little bit higher. Yeah, that's perfect. That's perfect. Yeah. So um, you can see you're, we're looking at the pelvis in standing here and this is the back. Okay, so we've the sacrum there. And then if somebody was lying down, that's the way we are. And that's the pelvic floor muscles there. So they go right the way around. They attach onto the pubic bone at the front and then they go around in a loop. This is called the levator ani muscles in a loop. And they attach onto the side walls of the pelvis on either side to the pubic bone at the front and underneath the sacrum and the coccyx at the back. So it's a big muscle looking inside. That's it. Okay, so a lot of muscle there in, and, and capable therefore of um, giving us great strength and control, but also capable of great dysfunction when it, when it goes wrong. And uh, the overlying more recognizable anatomy is, um, is there. We can see it. the urethra, the vagina, the perineal body there, and the, uh, and the back muscles. So important when we're talking about the pelvic floor is this superficial part and this deeper part as well, right? So that's the pelvic floor. And what should the pelvic floor do? So what it should do is we should be able to contract Okay, and if we're looking at contraction, here's the biceps, that's the muscle contracting and that's the muscle releasing. It's very common for the pelvic floor just to contract in half range, just squeezing in, releasing out, but actually it doesn't do, it doesn't go all the way up and it doesn't release all the way out. What should happen is 
these muscles from the, the back, you should see this. So here's what I've just taken out of the middle of the pelvis. This is around the back of the, the back passage. The vagina is here, urethra is here. It should be, when you're doing the pelvic floor contraction, that you think of squeezing the muscles from the back passage. This whole loop of levator A9 muscle here, this sling muscle as it goes back, that contracts from the back right the way up towards the front at the pubic bone. And that's where the bladder is then as well. So we've got that going from the back, upwards and forwards towards the front and releasing back. So upwards and forwards, back passage, up to the bladder and the release then is from the bladder back down towards the back passage. So the cues then to that <coughs> be tightening as if I'm trying to stop passing wind. Should I be tightening as if I'm trying to stop the urinary flow? Um, should I be stopping starting? So really your, your thought process is that you want to contract, pull up from around the back passage first, draw from the back up to the front and make sure that you're not just squeezing at the back passage, only you start at the front, you go right the way around to the front and then you squeeze also the muscles here that are at the entrance to the vagina. It's like the elevator analogy, you've heard of that before. We're trying, we're thinking of squeezing. This is the sixth floor up here. When we go to release, we're releasing all the way back down to the basement. Very hard for you to know, am I contracting to the sixth floor? Am I releasing back down to the basement? And how do I know? That's the part that's tricky. And that's where a physiotherapist will help because they would often suggest doing a vaginal examination. It's not always absolutely necessary. We can look and feel from the outside. We can look with ultrasound imaging and to see, but it's, um, it's a good idea if you didn't mind a therapist doing an internal examination. And then we can really determine, do you contract from the back? Do you lift the muscles up? How well do you lift them in the elevator? And how well do you release them? So if we look at the elevator again, it might be that you're just contracting or squeezing up as far as the second or third floor and that you only release down to the second or first floor. So the pelvic floor muscles in that case are probably quite taut, holding on, a little bit of tension there. They don't contract fantastically well and they don't release fantastically. Some pelvic floors will be very high in tone, right the way up the top up here, and actually they don't let go. And that one can be, that type of pelvic floor can be involved in some pain disorders. And then we can have weakness where the muscle is really quite weak and that might be after childbirth and takes a little bit of time to rehabilitate. So if I go back and just look at the, the four different areas that I've mentioned there, that when things go wrong with the pelvic floor, it can be better, Bladder would be bladder leakage, some urgency, some frequency, all the time looking for a toilet um, when you go out. Um, up at nights going to the toilet, eight times is the upper end of normal. We shouldn't be any more than eight times in a 24-hour period. So we can have bladder problems. We can have um, uh, leakage when you cough or sneeze or you're out or um, uh, doing a running and jumping, shouting at people, which I'm sure we don't do that much, but when we do, it can be a problem. And then we have um, bowel problems. So bowel can be flatulence, and it can be problems um, cleaning, wiping, and um, emptying properly, and um, staining in the pants. So all of those things are common enough. And um, on from that, we can have pelvic organ prolapse. And prolapse is descent of the vaginal wall at the front, the bladder wall, or descent of the, the back wall, that rectal wall, descending into the vagina or the uterus itself can descend. Again, normally related to childbirth, but not exclusively related to childbirth at all. People who haven't had children can have a prolapse. And, uh, and then pain, and, and pain is, um, is shocking. Um, to have a rectal vaginal pain um, that's there, persistent, there's quite a number of syndromes that can be um, attached to pain, but might be pain with the intercourse, and it might be just purely with the intercourse and not uh, part of any other chronic um, pain presentation. And this will bring us on to pain with intercourse part, um, the, what happens in menopause and even from 40s onwards. So um, when we get the hormonal changes, and this is where I'm going to be way out of my league by comparison to what Jane would be able to tell us, but um, the, the vaginal tissue does start to change. There's less estrogen there, vaginal atrophy becomes an issue, and the pelvic floor muscles start changing. Really important that this doesn't mean I'm doomed and pelvic floor muscle isn't going to work anymore. It just takes a little bit more work and it's just a bit um, harder to, uh, to get the muscles going because they might be stiff. If you're stiff around the shoulders, stiff around the back, 
stiff around the glute muscles, why on earth wouldn't you be stiff into the pelvic floor? So that's a big feature of in our 40s and 50s as well. And it's not just vaginal, vaginal atrophy. So we really want to look at and listen to somebody who has pain with intercourse um, or any se sexual activity. And, uh, and we want to just know, yes, is there vaginal atrophy there? And, um, and is there, um, what, what's the effect of um, pinning and uh, lack of estrogen on the pelvic floor muscles? Um, but then what's actually happening in the muscles as well? Because if they're restricted, if they're tight, if posture is poor, if you've had other back pain, other glute pain, anything else going on, your pelvic floor will be tight as well. So we shouldn't assume that it's all um, vaginal atrophy um, and menopause. We should actually assume that there, that there is some musculoskeletal postural side to this as well. So I suppose I'll, I'll be quiet now and I'll kind of let, let everybody else in, but um, I suppose what I'd like to, to get across um, with this is that there's so many different types of pelvic floors. We've got high tone pelvic floors that are holding on too much. We've got low tone pelvic floors that just didn't come back well enough after childbirth. And um, the, the, the breadth of what I would see clinically, it's, it's just absolutely huge. And to try and, um, I hope I've kind of touched on things for some people there, but there's often a mix of all of those presentations going on as well. Catherine, over. <laughs> thanks, th thanks, Maeve. Um, and and you, you, you definitely hit on a, a few of the questions that came in. Um, just one of them, when you talked about uh, the bladder, the leakage and, you know, nighttime uh, peeing and so forth, you'd mentioned eight times in 24, in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So what about, I know one of the questions that came through was, um, you know, a, a lady who said that she, she is brilliant for drinking water, but she finds that, you know, she'll have a glass of water and you know it could be 15 20 minutes later and she's peeing and she was just wondering is that normal or is that something that would indicate that uh, maybe she has some issues yeah um i'd be looking more at how often or how much that happens in the 24 hour period we should be able to have a small glass of water without running off immediately to have to empty it okay um, to our volumes should be in excess of 300 mils um, when we empty, so just get a sensation of um, a tickle of uh, fullness or uh, an urge. I need to go, and I'm not, you know, an, an, an over the top urge where I have to charge, but just a yes. sensation of fullness. And that should be in excess of 300. 200 mils would be too little to be getting that sensation. We shouldn't get that sensation. Maybe, okay. but do you know what? I, I, I might feel something in my bladder there, but if I do a few squeezes or if I go off and distract myself, Certainly, I don't need to go. Um, and, and some people would void 100 mils. And that's far too little. That's okay. the problem there. We, we do have an overactive bladder there. And an overactive bladder is where it's not the pelvic floor muscles. It's the, the bladder itself is overactive. And it is something that sometimes uh, does um, respond to physiotherapy. But sometimes a medication is needed to really quieten down um, what's happening at the, the nerve level. Um, at, the, uh, at the bladder. So is, should you be running off uh, to the toilet after 15 minutes? Not all the time. We should be able to hold on for a little bit more like that. If you're down a pint and if you had a cup of tea before, absolutely, you'd be, you'd be charging off. Um, and, but we should be able to hold for two hours, three hours, um, and, uh, and that's even with drinking a little bit of water. Tea and coffee, I'm sure everybody knows, are a no-no. During the night, try not to drink before. Yeah. And and Maeve, if you have this scenario where um, um, you know I, I, there's 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 a name on this, or there's certainly a name I've heard some of my my friends. Um, I think they, they call it like releasing the tap. Where say if um, if if they're out or whatever, and they're sitting down for ages, and everything is fine, and maybe they've sat down for two hours, all's fine. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden they go to the toilet. And then all of a sudden they need to go to the toilet again half an hour later. And all of a sudden, once they've gone that first time, it's like it's opening the floodgates. Yeah. What, 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 what's that telling you? See, the, 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 neck, the, the, the um, bladder might be passively filling quite nicely. And then, yeah, you're sitting down just by putting pressure on the perineum. That's actually quite quiet. And you might be sitting in a restaurant and um, fine for the whole course of it. And then actually, yeah, exactly like that, you open the floodgates floodgates and what has been going into the bladder might be 
a glass of wine, like a cup of tea or the coffee afterwards or the water. It can be that suddenly the neck of the bladder, once it has just been opened that little bit, so we, the neck of the bladder will, it, you know, that's the urethra and then into the, you know, the balloon of the bladder. And if the neck of the bladder has just been opened a little bit, and then if we don't have proper closure at that, a little bit of urine is then getting into the neck of the bladder and constantly telling the bladder, I need to go, I need to go. So you might need to go and do some of your sort of closing of the neck of the bladder exercises in order to really settle that down again and allow the bladder to start filling again. Okay. So it tells us that there's something going on at the neck of the bladder if that type of presentation. If that okay, happens. very good. Okay, um, and and um, it, it, and this may be for you or for Jane, but in terms of you, you talk there about um, a vaginal atrophy and pain, and I guess one of the things that I was thinking of is um, how how can uh, or can a person tell the difference between is it vaginal atrophy or is it uh, you know one of the four types you just you mentioned which is pain um can a, can a woman tell that or is it a matter of they'd have to go and be diagnosed um as it being either um pain bladder like pain um or a vaginal atrophy jane i'll give my one-liner answer and then i'm gonna i'm gonna pass over to you um, I would love to the, the, the sort of the, the, the quick short way to to find out are your pelvic floor muscles tight is to go in to your vagina yourself and go onto the muscles yourself and have a look. Okay, they're the ones that would be tight around that area. Yes, the entrance to the vagina as well, and you can have pain around that area at the back wall of the vagina. But if we just use this, it's a little bit easier to see. If you are sitting on the low. And if you just pop in an index finger or even a thumb into the vagina, just into the back wall of the vagina, you'll be sitting on the pelvic floor muscles there. Thumb out to the side or finger out to the side. If you're doing this side, finger to the side or thumb to the side. Now, if you just press on those muscles, they should be bouncy. They shouldn't be sore. There shouldn't be any discomfort. So if you press on them and you go, that is painful. Well, then that is a part of what's going on. Now, is it the full picture or is it in conjunction with the atrophy or is the atrophy causing the pelvic floor just to be a little bit annoyed and tightened up? That's the bit that would require an assessment in terms of the physio-musculoskeletal assessment. But a pretty good start is to find out yourself by just having a little feel. Okay, very good. Now, Jane. Jane, did you want to add to that, Jane? Jane, off you go. No, so this comes from a patient. You know, so, so I um, have seen Maria Elliott, who you know really well, and um, in the past. So I have vaginal atrophy and nerve damage. So I, I'm, on, I'm sort of on the pudendal scale of nervy issues. So I have both. So I had a very hypertonic pelvic floor because I was in pain. Um, and I, I still never have to do pelvic exercise, uh, floor exercise. I, I must never tighten and I always need to relax. But um, we soon realised that once we got the oestrogen in, and once we've got the HRT as well, because estrogen wasn't enough for me, my pelvic floor just went, oh, I can relax. And then physio could start with the internal and, and blah, 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 and all those things. Um, and for me, it's absolutely key that I never do a tightening exercise because my pain will come back very quickly. And I have now learned how to relax my pelvic floor, you know, just like that. I can bring it down just like that. But I do go every six months to see a women's health physio to check that my pelvic floor can still work perfectly up the elevator, which it can somehow by never doing pelvic floor exercises. So it is working, um, but I just, just check on it. But for me, the key to get it working and a lot of the pain to go and to relax and work in harmony was the estrogen. Right, okay. Okay, so I guess that that probably ties back to you know if someone is having uh, pain. I mean, your first port of call really is going to be your GP who's experienced with menopause, and then possibly maybe um, a physio who has experience as well, um, to basically just make sure you've got the right treatment protocol in place. I think a physio over. 
Well, well, I guess just if the estrogen, if the, if, right. if, yeah, if, yeah. if if HRT is required, then um, you know, yeah. and and I think, look, you know, I I'm becoming more optimistic by the day because you know we're definitely um, I had a super conversation with the with the GP today, um, who is absolutely gung ho on menopause and we're finding them we're definitely finding them throughout the country which which is brilliant I mean, it's not going to happen overnight but we're we're certainly getting there but i think the key is obviously um jane as you know well is getting the the right uh, the treatment protocol um just to kind of switch i i'll switch on to some of the questions and and i, I did want to go back to um me we we'll just talk again again in a few minutes about being proactive but um uh, yvonne um i started using um your shorts um a few months ago because uh, several of the girls that i run with um have used them and were raving about them and um i kind of thought yeah i definitely need to up my game <laughs> on 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 this side um and one of the questions that came through was uh, a lady had said i saw you're wearing evb sports catherine how do you find them um i will say Putting them on is a bit like putting on the old Spanx, <laughs> you know, um, for me anyway, it's, um, um, they're tight, but my God, when, when I run in them, I feel like everything is supported. Um, um, it, I couldn't compare it to running in the likes of Spanx because it's a long time since I actually wore a pair. Um, but I think they're probably, um, they're more, to me, they're more flexible. And certainly if you're a runner, they're very, very comfortable. Um, and I was um, doing kind of high mileage in terms of, um, you know, whether it's a, you're just doing 5K or you're kind of doing, you know, 12, 13 miles or whatever. And I actually found it didn't matter in terms of the mileage. I didn't get any uh, ch chafing, um, yes. which I know sometimes runners get a lot. So that's just something to, um, to mention because I know sometimes a lot of us would put Vaseline on different parts just to make sure we we don't um, have any side effects from it but um i i certainly um have found them found them fantastic um and i know that uh, i have the shorts ones which i believe yvonne i can wear for winter underneath kind of longer running um uh, leggings and so forth but um can you just give us uh, give us kind of you know talk us through i guess the other thing is is Yours is a personal journey and um, you're probably somewhat um, similar to me, except maybe a little bit more exasperated in terms of where it brought you. So um, maybe do you just want to explain that to everyone listening? Um, thanks a million, um, Catherine. Honoured to be here amongst this um, amazing panel. Um, I stumbled into um, pelvic health from my own personal experience, um, running too soon after baby number three, but as a chartered engineer, knew that there was um, there was definitely a, a need out there to provide um, um, support where that actually would take the impact of the pelvic floor muscles. And so with seven years I'm um, in this industry and um, looking at things perhaps as an engineer, you know, and there's, in total in the seven years, there's about a million euros worth of R&D gone into what we have created. And in terms of the type of materials, the manner in which they're put together, um, just reinforces those core muscles. And, um, you know, Catherine, I suppose it, it, um, it's a privilege to be in and doing something that you want to do. I, I, I personally have spoken to thousands of women all over the world, you know, and um, the, um, when it works, you talk about the fish, you know, it molds into your shape. Mm. When it works, when it fits, it's like nothing else. And I wouldn't dream of running in anything else. And um, I think that, you know, what we've done over the years is listened to and, and created the size guide. We're bringing out measuring tapes now. And I, I just think that the, I mean, the most important thing is um, the customer service in the company is all about that fit and that size. And if you get it right, yeah, it's hard to wriggle in. But then it will mold into your shape. But it, it's um, more important to us is um, you know learning and and you know uh, understanding what's actually going out on the ground. You know with women whether or not they are exercising or not exercising, or whether or not the symptoms that they have stop them from exercising. So we're very keen on. I mean, the best way the product works is is in conjunction with women's health physiotherapists. 
that's just the to me the ideal scenario because like um like Maeve talked earlier on there and Jane talked about her own experiences with, with pelvic health physiotherapy and um, you've got to know your body yourself there's no doctor there's no nurse there's nobody's going to tell you um how you're feeling and and what I've found over the seven years Catherine and, and kind of why you know drives me to be in this business is the education at the basic level mm -hmm. Maeve talked about bladder health you know how many times we should be um you know, going to the toilet um, during the day, good bladder health, good bowel health, little simple things. But actually out there, it's so poor that, you know, women are not taking charge of that knowledge and that, I mean, I don't know, I mean, who's at fault there in that regard, but I think, I mean, you, there's, uh, you said you're finding GPs out there that are, you know, running for the cause and, and fighting for good information and education out there. I think that it's definitely changing from seven years ago when I started this journey. But I think um, there's lots of basic stuff that women could empower and take control themselves um, and, and arm themselves with, you know, um, bladder diaries, trigger diaries, when, when during the month are, are my symptoms most exacerbated. And, um, arm themselves with that information and then go see the, you know, the GP, the physio, the consultant. But I'm, I'm hearing a lot from um, women across the world that they are waiting for their gynae up, you know, appointment. And with COVID, it, it was delayed and some women were waiting up to 18 months for um, an appointment. And what was happening then was they were expecting a silver bullet, you know, they were expecting mm. a tablet to, to solve their problems. And they could have done so much in the meantime, you know, and empowered themselves with so much more, much more knowledge. And if there's anything, if, if tonight, if any, anybody's listening there from a, a girl that's um, experienced leakage while she was running and just speaking to women, as I said, all over the world on a daily basis is, you know, find out the basics about um, good bladder and bowel health and, and how to do those pelvic floor exercises. It isn't easy, you know, but it, once it is, once you know how to do it correctly with a women's health physiotherapist, you know, this, and do them for life, there is no better medicine. There's no better medicine out there. And I've, I've talked to women that have taken control back and, and done that. And they're like new women, you know, that it's just, it's, it's, if it works, the physiotherapy works, you will never look back because there isn't to me an alternative. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, what you're saying, the empowerment side of it, I, I mean, um, Yvonne, we, we've talked about this at length ourselves. I mean, we know we've got a journey there to go in terms of um, education. And look, I'm all for knowledge is power. And I mean, if you look at, say, France, um, uh, after someone has a child, they have uh, their access to physiotherapy pretty much, you know, as soon as their bodies uh, are back to some normality. And I think we need a lot more education in this country around um, pelvic, pelvic health, that's for sure. Um, I mean, I would hope I would hope that that will come in time, um, but you know it's uh, I guess another 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 thing we have to we have to tackle. Um, just just to go through um, some of the questions, and uh, now we've covered some of them already, but I'll just read them in case. Uh, how often should I be peeing? We've covered that. Um, uh, oh, um, Maeve, um, proactive steps you can take in your forties to prevent issues from menopause. Um, and I guess that was something I wanted to talk about anyway, in terms of, you know, what's your advice to, I always, I always think when it comes to menopause, um, being proactive is key. So, you know, if you set yourself up, um, you know, if it is natural menopause in your early 40s, so that, you know, you're prepared, um, uh, you kind of, you're ticking the boxes in terms of your lifestyle habits, it can make the, the, the menopause transition that bit is easier. But what are the additional steps you would say can, can help women? Um, I think general whole body fitness and health is, is uh, so important. So to be looking at for you, what's the best? Is it, you know, is it running? Um, is it fast walking? Is it gym? Is it tennis? Is it, what is it? And what suits you and what suits your body? And 
because we're on pelvic floor and on pelvic health, what way is your pelvic floor and your pelvis responding to the type of exercise that you think is best uh, for you or that you want to do? So to be in tune with that, I think is really important. So if, if you're overtraining, if you're doing too much, and if your pelvic floor isn't able for that, well, it's an accident going to happen because you've a, a tight and stiff pelvic floor, which is responding negatively to how you're doing your running and what you're doing. You're not looking after your pelvic floor and then menopause comes and gets all the blame where really the body was absolutely just not fitted to how the pelvic floor was coming into menopause. So everybody wants to be fit. We want to be fit. We just have to be fit. And it's, you know, what are we able to do? What, what, what can and what can we do? And are we shooting for just too high with what we want to do? And if I talk about something like Yvonne's shorts, and I'll get back to what we should do pelvic floor wise in a minute. But something like, you know, using um, Yvonne's sport shorts is just so key for people who want to do that higher level of activity, you know, the fast walking um, or the running. Now, I, through a little bit of vanity, I'd wear the, um, the sport shorts going into um, under a tracksuit going into Super Value on a Saturday because actually they just lift up your bum anyway. But that's <laughs> <laughs> that's a nice <laughs> ad. <laughs> um, but when you are um, when you are out for your run or for your walk, to have that support there and to not be allowing the pelvic floor load up in a negative way, so it's getting all the support and and, and again back to the activity not being um, not being too much for you. So what can happen from a physio aspect, and we kind of talked about the whole um, thing that Jane says, um, absolutely, with the, the um, assessing the hormone side of it as well. But if I just stick, stick to the musculoskeletal side of it, if you are doing an activity that isn't suited to you, if you're doing a lot of hit, if you're doing boot camp, if you're running too many kilometers from what you should be, your pelvic floor muscles through your glutes, through your lumbar spine, and um, through the perineum as well can get really stiff and tall. So you've lost your range of movement there before you even start to um, get um, changes in, in hormones. So what I would say is that, I mean, the ideal is that you would have your pelvic floor assessed, but not everybody can do that, I totally understand that. But to know yourself, how you think your pelvic floor is, and that one first thing I said there, palpating your own pelvic floor, do I think my pelvic floor is in trouble? Well, in you go and have a, have a little peep and a little feel and see whether you think your muscles are in trouble. Then can you do the elevator? Can you squeeze all the way up to the top, the sixth floor, and can you release all the way down basement, down to the basement, first floor, ground floor, basement? Can you get it all the way down? If you think you can, actually your pelvic floor is in pretty good shape. So that's good. And obviously the type of exercise that you're doing is not loading up too negative. So get going on your pelvic floor exercises. Do your, in terms of how much and how many, how often. Ideally, wonderful would be if we did our pelvic floor exercises three times a day. We're realistic about it. We probably do them once or twice a day. If you're going through very active treatment with the physiotherapist, yes, make sure to do them three times a day. But as a maintenance and as preparation just for life and what we should be doing all the time, once or twice, 10 seconds, 10 repetitions, and doing those anywhere between your one and your three times a day. But being really clear, are you just doing tighten, stop tighten, tighten, stop tighten, where you're really not getting that full range of movement? Or are you really being um, very therapeutic for your pelvic floor as well by releasing that all the way out and contracting it all the way up? And that leads you along with the palpation and the feeling of that. That tells you that you're on top of um, you're on top of your pelvic floor before in your forties, Catherine, as you said before. We don't want to be waiting to say, God, what happened? Menopause. It's all the menopause term, but actually, it's not all the menopause at all. Yeah. Your floor was stiff as a poker before you ever went into the menopause. Yeah, poor menopause gets bad rep the whole time. <laughs> and I guess one of the things I remember, um, and this was definitely before I went to see you, I think you obviously taught me in terms of the right way to do the pelvic floor, but there definitely was years ago the idea that the best way to do it was when you were sitting on the toilet and stopping your pee. Um, but um, uh, that's not the way to do it, really. We want to 
follow what you're saying in terms of the elevator approach and just trying to make sure you can um, relax the muscles that way. If, if um, made for people around the country or in different areas, you're based here in Dublin, but for is, is how can people find out if there is specific women's health physios in their area? Is there, um, you know, where can you get that information? Uh, the, um, the, our society, the Irish Society of Charter Physiotherapists, holds, um, it's iscp.ie, it holds a list of physiotherapists who work either HSE or private practice throughout the country. So if somebody phones them, they would get a recommendation of somebody who's in their area. Okay. We have, within the ISCP, we have a clinical interest group which is Chartered Physiotherapists in Women's Health and Continent. And our, um, the committees for that group always look after this list and make sure this list that our society have is up to date and really specifies, is it women? Um, is it, do they work with men? Do they work with children? And do they work with pain and all of that? So the, the society should have that information. Okay, okay, great, okay. Um, okay, just to um, just go through some of the other questions. Um, uh, sorry. Um, I, when pelvic floor exercises haven't worked, I did see um, a, a specialist physio and I don't want to take, I don't want to get the mesh. Uh, what are my options? Yeah. Um, really I mean, one, just one thing on that, Maeve, is, is the... I know the mesh is a whole other conversation. Well, we, there's a few more questions on it here, but um, are those surgeries allowed to go ahead now um, in Ireland or what's the latest on it? Um, no, I mean, it's tough on, um, on patients, exactly that, that core there who's, who's um, um, really needs, failed physiotherapy needs to have the continence surgery. And, you know, it's not okay to be going through your life leaking with exercise, coughing and sneezing. And if physiotherapy has failed for that, well, then we really do want to, to see what other help is there. The gold standard um, through research over the years for, for support of the urethra within surgery has been this sling procedure. And that's a an, um, transobturator tape or transvaginal tape, so they're TBT or TOT are the names of those surgeries. And um, they are, because they are a mesh um, along with the other prolapse mesh surgeries, they have been put on pause. Now, unfortunately, it's gone on to a long-term pause and uh, we don't know what's going to happen. And it is, it's on the background of people who have had these surgeries and have mesh put into place and have developed pain. Um, so obviously people who've had that as a problem, it's, um, it's very emotive, um, it's huge, it's ruined their lives. But people who have continence still need an answer as well. Have in, you know, issues still need an answer at the moment as we wait to see whether that comes in in any way shape or form again what the consultants are proposing um, and what they are doing at the moment is urethral bulking so they can inject urethral bulking agent into the urethra and that just remember i was talking just then about the sort of the the, the, the wider neck of the, the part. we have the urethral lumen which can be that little bit wide as a result of damage childbirth in particular with that sort of shearing so that area can be injected to bulk it and with some people that can be positive and then in the long term the, uh, the what might happen is that um, a, um the sling some soft tissue is taken from, from some other part of the body for example from the abdomen and that piece of tissue is used as the sling on the urethra okay um, some doctors are doing that already and some are probably waiting really just to see what, what happens and whether the other surgery is coming. Okay. Um, okay. And just while we're on that, there was another, uh, let me, sorry, let me just find it. There was another, yeah, there's another question on the mesh. Um, had, the the, had the vaginal nylon mesh six years ago, all went fine, no issues whatsoever. I have started to notice slight leakage now. What can I do? Um, exercises. Uh, where okay. is do the exercises um, and, and have the pelvic floor assessed again. Some, some negative tension could have prepped in there. Um, it depends, of course, you know, the, the vaginal estrogen needs to be assessed as well, um, whether that's needed, whether the vaginal atrophy. So that might be very beneficial. We, we do know that the 
agile environment changes over time and that the bladder is more susceptible to certainly urgency and frequency as a result of what's happening in that vaginal environment. So that could be, as time goes on, that uh, could be playing a role. So I'd certainly get the, um, the pelvic floor, check out with the GP uh, with regard to vaginal atrophy. Okay. Um, so, and, um, so really after, after that, um, have the pelvic floor assessed, if you're doing the pelvic floor exercise correctly, has some negative tension built up there. So if that's all checked out and we're happy with all of that, then the, the next thing surgically is, is not a great option. It's revising the, the sling. Now, that's not even an option at the moment in terms of okay. nobody can do that with her at the moment. So it's putting all of that on the, on, on the long finger and seeing what happens with regard to this ban on mesh and to, to probably another visit. I'm sure she's absolutely sick of physiotherapy, haven't been through all of this, but yeah. another physiotherapist. Um, and I guess, so. would you say, um, maybe Vaughan, either of you, I mean, I, I, I would imagine something like that. Um, Yvonne, your, your shorts could help in a situation like that, or what would you think, Maeve? You know, would it be something that would be helpful anyway? It's not gonna go against the green. For sure, there's absolutely nothing. It, it, it goes without saying, there's no question of it being in anything, anyway negative. Some things, some, um, and, and, and Yvonne has, has heard this before, some, some people say, well, if I wear the shorts, does that take away my um, ability, to, my, my effort at control, and that the, the, um, the, the um, looking at, Noel asking what's the name of the shorts. Yeah. <laughs> Go back there. <laughs> BB shorts. Yeah. <laughs> so shorts. Uh, there is um by by reinforcing and by holding, by lifting up the perineum. Now you've done loads of research around her shorts and has been able to show that the perineum does lift up that little bit. We lift up the perineum, are we actually lifting up the bladder itself? We don't know. It's hard to measure all these things exactly how high the bladder would be lifting up. Um, and what is happening, but it is, something is happening there. There's a compression from front to back, there's a lift up of the perineum. And the, the bladder behaves differently. Now, not for everybody, but for a lot of people. And to not try them is a mistake, I think. Any yeah. prolapse, um, bladder control, bowel issues, anybody exercising over the age of in their 40s, I think should have a, a, a pair of these shorts. So it's a Yvonne, great. can so, thanks, Maeve. Yvonne, can you wear the shorts like in place of a knickers, or uh, are you are you working on something like that? Well, the Bobla briefs, um, Catherine, are ah yeah, uh, that can be worn. You know, I mean, for girls um, that need them on a daily, let's say the you know the girl that um, has prolapse after baby number one and yeah. finding it yeah. difficult to actually function throughout the day, the boxer briefs are an ideal option to do that. Um, I just wanted to um, catch and jump in there because I hear an awful lot of, of girls that have tried physio a number of years ago. I suppose um, there's much more knowledge now that, the, you know, it, it sometimes we're, we're our own worst enemies. If we don't have our leg cut off or our arm cut off, it's not really impacting our life that much. Um, we don't really adhere to, you know, we're not at death's door, basically, so we can continue to uh, to function and stuff like that. But an awful lot of women would be would be honest with me and say they didn't adhere to the pelvic floor exercises that the physio would have given them the first time around. And and on, on my hand and heart now, as I said, listening to all those women over the last number of years and listening to some people that have undertaken the, the surgery, um, go back to the physio really try it again with the knowledge and said basic information and and ask about um you know really understand exactly how to contract and and and, and jane or you mentioned earlier on she goes back every six months mm -hmm. i myself have gone back every six months and i've had the, the privilege of having an ultrasound look at how i'm actually contracting pelvic floor muscles and I, I just think even it's like an NCT Catherine you know <laughs> it really is you should you know it's it's to me um until it goes wrong it really does and it can have more implications than uh, you know your your foot or your leg put off you know it can have so much uh, bad implications on your your uh, isolation and um just not getting on with the daily activity so to me it's uh, go back to that physio and and um really understand again and and then do exactly what they tell you to do 
Okay. Yeah. Great. I, I, I certainly echo that. I, I definitely think I need to check in for my NCT. <laughs> yes. I'll be ringing you tomorrow, Maeve. <laughs> no, no. Um, Yvonne needs to put on the, the, uh, the Navy t-shirt. I'll tell you what, a great old plug for physiotherapy there. Uh, <laughs> you're very um, good. <laughs> um, just, um, uh, Jane, um, Jane, there was a question um, in relation to uh, vaginal atrophy, um, just from a, a woman who has said that uh, she's gone to her GP, her GP prescribed Vagifem, um, but she hasn't found, she hasn't gotten any relief um, from the Vagifem and um, her GP is kind of saying to her, you need to keep going with the Vagifem. Um, you, what, she just would like to know what your thoughts are in terms of other options. One, one thing that I did, did just uh, question, uh, ask her, this was on email, so I hadn't heard back before um, the call was, I was just saying, look, were you also doing moisturizer and so forth? And she did come back saying that she was but she said she even on the first two weeks of Vagifem she didn't feel any improvements um, in the symptoms she was experiencing so um, what are your thoughts on that one? Um, <coughs> sorry excuse me obviously I'm not a medic at all um, but so I'm going to say is, is her pain all inside and external is fine but if it's it, so, it's, so we're going on the, on the thing first that we're saying is inside external. It's both. It, it's it's but, both. I, I did ask her that, so and I, yeah. She must be examined because so many women are being given out vagifem without even being examined because they're you know if it's external there's a symptom you know something called lichen sclerosis that is actually quite similar to vaginal atrophy and it's a big myth that you have to have the white patches. You you really do not. But regards the vagifem, so it can take. And if you look on the um, British Menopause Society consensus thing about vagina atrophy, it can take for some women up to six months to notice a difference. It's not a quick fix for a lot of ladies, not as quick as is, is assumed. If she's only using it twice a week, you know, they do now know that that's not enough and it can mm. go up to five times a week. Um, unfortunately, you know, the head of the British Menopause Society has told us that. We know all this. Medics who know about it know this, but it hasn't actually got down to the GP. Mm. Hmm. Um, but in the UK, we have eight different types of, you know, prescriptions available. So it might be the one she's trying isn't right for her. But a lot of us also need to use our in Vagifem inside, but also an Eastern cream outside. But she does need to check that she doesn't have another dermatological problem externally and not assume. Um, and if something doesn't get better after three months externally, I think in the UK we would then ask. To see a vulva dermatologist or something. I, I'm I'm struggling to find um to get a recommendation of a vulva dermatologist here in Ireland. So Maeve, I don't know if you know of anyone, but um I, I, I had reached out to um the society here but I, I haven't heard any anything back. And when you look at the different criteria, it's not the same as the UK Jane, you don't have um there's not the same kind of options um in yeah, terms an of an awful lot of ladies in my group are who aren't getting better and um, they are then because we have a vulva dermatologist seen a vulva dermatologist or a gynecologist who specializes in vulva because not all of them do they mm. are being diagnosed quite a lot being diagnosed with lichen sclerosis and they don't even have the white patches at all okay um, but it's quite more common not common common but to have vaginal atrophy and lichen sclerosis at the same time so you've got to have a really good specialist who sees the two because both those things need completely different things so if she's not getting better she needs to protect perhaps look further or she might just need an eastern cream externally um, yeah. which is because you know vagifem really does only work inside as yeah the, the summit does do all but in the uk we have these these two available yeah, yeah. i don't know what you have yeah. Yeah, no, she is. She is using an external cream as well because I had um, I had ch checked that. Yeah, yeah, and she's she's also she's also using um, um, uh, one of the yes moisturizers um, externally, and she said she was getting some relief, but just in terms of the general symptoms i think more internally than externally just isn't seeing the improvement um there's just a question there jane and um, what do the white patches look like and where on the skin will they be inside the vulva or on the outside it's well, on the outside isn't that right well lichen sclerosis is, is only what they call external you can get lichen plainness mm. which is but lichen sclerosis um yeah 
everyone thinks it's characterized by white patches. That is more of the common thing and a shiny sort of almost papery thin skin. But there's a lot of ladies in my group who are, and I say just red raw, they are red raw. They can't get it better from it. They don't have any white patches at all and they have a biopsy and it's, it's positive for lichen sclerosis. And that's the thing, actually can also make you look red raw and thin in and, and all these things. So if you're not getting better from vaginal dryness, vaginal atrophy, then you need to think on to the next stage, could this be something else where a specialist, I think if it's beyond a GP, like in the UK we would turn up at a gum clinic, but I don't know if you have things like gum clinics. No, no, not here. No, I think it's really a matter of uh, kind of tracking down a very, very good gynecologist and, you know, having the women's health physio alongside as well. Um, yeah, um, I'm just conscious of the time. So let me just go through some of the other questions that are here. Um, OK, this uh, lady, um, age 72, she's had five kids. Uh, she's had incontinence for many years. She attends GP specialists, etc. Over 10 years ago, she had the sling inserted for stress and incon for stress incontinence, not for the other, um, which I think must be general incontinence, which she used pads for. And she's also had medication. The medication led to certain UTIs. Um, she has been looking at the Innovo product, um, but told because of varicose veins, she cannot use it. Um, she's attended two. Uh, physios given various exercises will it help and is there any medication we'd recommend uh, so uh, Maeve there's probably three questions there um, is do you agree um, with the Innova product and um, that because she's varicose veins she can't use it or are you familiar with, enough with it yeah I mean I think we need to be I, I don't know whether you know where the veins are and what to send a bit anything that goes yeah we do need to be careful um, with the um, where the current converges, you know, so we've got with the Innova, we've got a cross current going through, and it depends on where where the, the varicosities are. Um, so I would be cautious. Certainly, there's a difference in blood flow through the area, and there could be some degree of discomfort depending on where this current crosses. So it's called a multi path current that crosses through the pelvic floor. So I would check that out with her, with her, um, with her gynae and be sure, be sure. So before actually throwing it out, that that actually is and yeah. that, that's the case. Um, and, and she also said the various exercises, I, I, I'd say by the sounds of it, I mean, she's had a pretty long journey. You know, oh, she's yeah. 72. She's wondering, I, I, you know, I think she's, I, I think she's just, you know, will the exercises help? I mean, from my perspective, I've done the exercise. I mean, it's definitely something we all need to incorporate into our lives. Um, um, unless, you know, it's like Jane where um, they go against the green first. But I think for the vast majority of us, of us it, it needs to become part of our, our daily habits. Um, yeah, and, and I think the only other thing to add into all of that, I mean, what, um, what I do a bit of within the doors is manual therapy as well. So, if there is a lot of um, tension there, try the pelvic floor exercises, nothing, you know, they're not working, not getting the muscles going. It's possible to facilitate the muscles with a little bit more hands-on, and that might sound terribly appealing um, to, to a listener with a little bit more hands-on, but it's internal manual therapy, really trying to facilitate the muscles, which can give then a better idea and a better sense of actually using the pelvic floor muscles. Now, that's just as, a, as another aside and just again, like everyone said, checking, 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 she is doing them correctly and because that does need, if somebody's got long-term problems, um, certainly twice a year is a reasonable amount of time to be rolling up. Having said that, she could well be listening to this and going, oh my goodness, I have just done all of that yeah. at the end of my, of my tether. Um, and I think going to, that's it, sort of going to urologists and getting the, Okay, so within urology, what are my options now? Failed physiotherapy, failed medication, um, and you know all of the different types of um, physio, as we've said there, including not being able to use a muscle stimulator. Now, what's a urologist going to say? So the next things would be perhaps uh, Botox into the bladder, which can be very effective, and it is being used more and more as well for people who have sort of much further down the line and, and are failing all these other 
options. So a visit to a urologist would be a good idea at this stage because right. you know it's not okay to be living with this. And if it was me, um, as she's describing, I'd be really kind of pushing now. What next? What else? What else? I really want. I really, really want to get dry. Yeah. Okay. Um, and just leading on for that, um, are looser bowels in post-menopause common? Is it related to pelvic floors? I have not had children. I'm a runner. Whenever I run, she was very specific about this. She said that whenever she runs, she has to stop for a, a poo, and it's only when she runs. Yeah. Um, it's common, okay? Starters. It's common. It's a well-known thing with runners that you might have to dash into the trees. All right. I, I remember um, that from my marathon training. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's not great, and you do want to try and empty and have empty. But the very action of running, you know, really, sometimes people who have problems with constipation to get out and have a good old, you know, fast walk. See if we can jig things around and ring it. Of course, then when you're when you're running, that's uh, that's an issue. So yeah, the obvious one, trying to get the diet right so that you are actually emptying better. And um, so that's the one thing. But the other one is, it's not, it doesn't necessarily mean that that sphincter is weak. You can also have that tension in the pelvic floor and that tension stops you. So we're kind of, I'll, I'll do the circular bit for the, you know, for the sphincter now as we're doing that. That tension that's there stops you controlling and releasing and um, contracting and releasing properly. And through the tension, as a runner, that might have built up through the glutes, through the perineum, through a long history of running, those muscles could just be getting tighter and tighter. And that range of movement that we talk about could be becoming less and less. Now, that can actually happen. It doesn't mean that you have a fantastically strong pelvic floor. It means your, your control is actually reduced. So finding out um, in terms of um, bowel habit, can you improve your diet? Can you empty your bowel better on your previous attempt and um, is your pelvic floor contracting properly and is it releasing properly in order to empty correctly as well so it's an urgency that we're uh, dealing with can be hypertonic pelvic floor and it's not just about weakness okay. um, and we shouldn't you know as we get older we all are going to become a little bit more flatulent we're all, all just going to become a little bit in our you know late 70s 80s but we we can do absolutely loads and we should not in our 40s 50s 60s we should not have problems with our instinctive and we must work to get back and um, whatever yeah. control we have lost there. And that is a bit of work. It's entirely doable. Yeah. Okay. Um, Jane, um, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll like this one, Jane. <laughs> not. <laughs> um, I've uh, vaginal atrophy. There's a history of breast cancer in my family. Um, I've been told under no circumstances by my GP, can I take any form of HRT? Now, um, I did go back to her and I did give her some um, links um, from the British Medical, um, the British, sorry, the British Menopause Society and Dr. Louise Newson in terms of some material to point towards the fact, um, in actual fact, uh, yes, yes, you can. But um, Jane, do you want to comment um, on that uh, for a minute? Because I do know this comes up a lot. Um, so as you know, I run a group with three and a half thousand women with vaginal atrophy in. There are a lot of ladies with breast cancer in. We have some with um, active ovarian cancer as well. And I have recently done a video with Dr. Sarah Ball, who is a menopause specialist. And we just discussed all of this. Um, and you can, you know, there's enough evidence out there that you can have local estrogen. And anyway, in the world of medicine, in the world of HRT, there is no such thing as no, you cannot. It's all about informed choice mm. for mm. patients. Um, and Dr. Louise Newson has done three very good videos recently with um, oncologists, breast surgeons, and the book Eastern Matters. Both his wife and um, daughter have both had breast cancer. They're actually on full HRT. Um, but the three oncologists that Dr. Louise Newson has done them with and Sarah Ball all say, without a doubt, you can use local estrogen because the uh, long term effects on your vaginal, bladder, vulva area um, needs to be seriously considered you know i have ladies in my group who are on hrt who've had estrogen receptive breast cancer yeah not yeah. just and local estrogen 
And I, I, I think also it's, it's always very good to point out the fact, um, you know, if you're taking the treatment protocol of, say, for example, Vagifem, uh, one year's supply of Vagifem is, is equal to one oral HRT tablet. So I think it's very important to put it in perspective. And plus, you know, as we know, vaginal atrophy can become a chronic condition and you, you have to take it seriously. Um, so um, I did give some other recommendations um, of um, resources as well. And the, the lowest, the lowest, lowest of all the Eastrons, if she really wants the lowest one, but I don't know if you have it in Ireland, it's called Invagis. Yeah. 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 Because that's that's the lowest of them all, but they're all still incredibly low. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. Thanks, Jane. Um. I we'll try and get in two more two more questions here. Um. Uh, Jane, you can probably answer this one as well. Um. Can only last two hours without visiting the bathroom. Have given up caffeine. Started HRT one month ago. Other options if HRT does not help. Would pelvic floor exercises help? I did go back and actually say, look, one month. Um. To be honest, you need to give it longer. Um. But mm -hmm. anything you you want to add to that? I well, guess you do need to give it longer because as you've just said, using Vagifem twice a week is equivalent to one HRT pill a year. Yeah. A month plus is like... Uh, Drop in the know. ocean. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, um, and then I think we've answered the second part with pelvic floor exercises help. I think, Maeve, we've, we've, uh, we've, we've pretty, pretty much covered that one. Um, um, yeah, one other thing, I suppose I would like to say that, you know, on that kind of urgency frequency, um, it's really, really common. I know I kind of to feel frequency. It's really common that urgency frequency symptoms would have some of that pelvic floor tension in there as well. And that that just pulls and drags and gnaws at the neck of the bladder, annoying it, just causing a little bit of that opening as well. So it's really worth um, finding out whether there's an underlying tension there again in to all of the, the uh, vaginal uh, hormone considerations. I think that probably that probably goes back to you know I, I think I would often say because uh, when it comes to to menopause and it's no blood test will tell you you know exactly where you are in perimenopause menopause journey as such but where it is important when you come to general menopause symptoms it's to rule out you know if your thyroid issue are you anemic low vitamin 12 b12 etc etc i think you know i'm i would often say to women look you need to be at least getting your bloods done once a year i think an add-on to that is i think you know women need to be checking in with their female physio on um on a regular enough basis because particularly when we when we uh, come into our 40s and um, so that we actually know how things are as well as doing the, the palpitations as um the palpitation as you mentioned earlier Maeve you know prevention oh, yeah. prevention i'm all about prevention <laughs> um just two two okay two last ones i get recurrent utis i have an antibiotic after antibiotic nothing nothing works i'm at the end of my tether what can i do um utis i mean utis come up a lot and i i yeah. jane yeah. as you know um you know the chronic uti group that's there on instagram at the moment she's doing a fantastic job in terms of you know raising the awareness around utis and um, but really you know for me one of the things i'd be looking at here is is uh, she didn't mention i didn't get i didn't get to go back on this one in terms of uh, whether she's on any other medication um uh, you know if if she's menopause or perimenopause because your vaginal bladder problems can start in perimenopause it's a myth that it's just post then i would be wanting to trial without a doubt local estrogen probably more than the twice a week because that is minimum but we also do know that without a doubt that uti testing is not fit for purpose um and more being missed in the lab than are being found they know so it is a whole big huge horn nest basically yeah. I would start with um, Eastern because um, the bladder does like it and we are more prone to infections. Yeah. And, and I think one thing that I've noticed here, Jane, I think I've mentioned it to you, I've noticed that uh, quite a few um, women have reached out to me uh, recently in Ireland about um, embedded UTIs and the fact um, there is very little support for it here in Ireland. And um, what's the name of the girl who set up that Instagram group? So Chronic 
a chronic UTI girl, but I yeah. did a video. I did a video with Dr. Catriona Anderson three weeks ago that's had twenty three thousand oh. views. Okay, wow! So I see that's, cool. that's mentioned here. Um, so that's all about embedded UTIs and Brilliant. Fat okay. Fat for purpose and dipsticks are really quite pointless as well. The whole the whole thing is a complete how it all came about and everything. So there's a video by Dr. Catriona Anderson that is completely opens Pandora's box. Okay, so so on Instagram you can follow Chronic UTI Girl. Um, if you also go onto Jane's page on Instagram or Facebook, uh, My Menopausal Vagina, you have a look at Jane's interview with um, Dr. Anderson and, um, and that Dr. Sarah Ball and Dr. Sarah Ball as well. I'm sorry, so Dr. Dr. Sarah Ball. Ball yeah, estrogen one and Dr. Catriona Anderson is the embedded UTI one. Okay. Okay. Um, and um, okay, last one. Um, uh, Yvonne, this is for you and me. <laughs> um, uh, Catherine, I know you are an avid runner. Um, I started running since the lockdown and COVID. Um, I'm experiencing slight leakage. Um, what do you wear when you're running? So um, I did go back saying I used to wear, well, I do sometimes when it's not a long run, an easy run. I uh, love kind of um, sweaty betties and all those types of things but um, now I have to say when I'm on, the, on a longer run and particularly if, um, if I'm doing any trail running up the mountains um, I don't do it without the EVB sports to be honest because um, I think since I've started using them um, the support I feel in them uh, as well like sweaty betty and some of these other um sports clothes can be fantastic and they're 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 lovely to wear um but i think the once you put on a pair of um of evb evb shorts uh, you notice you'll notice the difference um, and what i would probably say is have a look at um, uh, Yvonne's website because there's some good information there in terms of how how it's made and um, there's also some really good information from women's health physios um, endorsing the product and just basically explaining um, I guess the engineering side with which Yvonne would have all of that um, um, in terms of how that works and I should also mention um, Yvonne you just won an award last week in the UK for your product um, right. Yeah, they're catching um, delighted women's running UK product of the year 2020 in the uh, value for money category. So we're really thrilled with that. There was 1500 products tested and it's, um, look, Jesus, you know, to get, get pelvic health on in mainstream women's running magazines is just, you know, it, that's just the icing on the cake. So they'll get the information out because we work, we, you know, everywhere we go, all our leaflets information is go speak to, a, you know, a pelvic health physiotherapist, the therapy works beautifully hand in hand together. But just in relation to catching that, that previous question, there was a beautiful study last year from America um, where there was um, two runners analysed. It was just an abstract in Mitchell. It was in, um, there were two runners analysed and the physiotherapists had brought the girls. They were coughing and sneezing. They were leaking on coughing, sneezing and um, general exercise and running as well. And the physiotherapy had uh, rehabbed them completely dry um, but the one thing was beyond five miles or something like that, they continued to leak. And she just changed the cadence and she changed the posture of these girls and they were both uh, completely dry. And I just think it, it, for us it's wonderful because we did a little bit of, um, we did a great study out in UCD looking at the biomechanics and, and posture changes. And it's just to me a total sense that everything is aligned correctly to enable the urethra to, to, to function to its optimum. And um, so just maybe, you know, perhaps in relation to that girl's question, first of all, go to a women's health physiotherapist. Um, and yes, EDBs would be ideal for her, I would imagine. Uh -huh. I think I think because so many people have taken up running in COVID because you can get out, it's free, you know, there's no gyms or whatever. I, Maeve, I think you might be busy yet. <laughs> um, um, uh, look, I think we've 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 covered uh, pretty much all the questions through the conversation as well as anything. Um, so huge, huge thanks to to. Um, 
to all the ladies for taking their evenings, to Maeve, to Jane, to Yvonne. Um, it's been really fantastic. I've certainly um, learned some, thing, some new things as well, which I always love about these panel chats. And uh, Maeve, I will be ringing you tomorrow <laughs> for my NCT, my NCT check-in. <laughs> Um, but um, no, this is great and um, this will be, I will send this out on email. I know quite a few people had requested a copy on email and it will be saved on um, social media um, platforms um, as well. So thanks to everybody who joined as well. I hope you found it um, informative and if there's any questions um, at all, um, please feel free to drop me an email. Okay, thank you. Thank night you.